a way to make an entrance. This is my destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. In the frigid Canadian north, young pilots seeking adventure. That's why all those guys are up here. Battled the elements in World War II planes. <laughs> On this episode, Buffalo hits thin ice. <laughs> Joe blasts a rookie. Do that over again. Just don't touch <laughs> And Uncle Mikey strikes out. It's beautiful. <laughs> Hang on to your hats, boy. The weather may be getting warmer in Canada's Northwest Territories, the home of Buffalo Airways. But Jimmy Essery is hoping things stay cold just a little bit longer. Well, we're loading up to go and uh, put an ice strip for, for Buffalo Airways for C-46 and a DC-3. They used to load these things where you couldn't get a credit card in after. Yeah. Jimmy's a mechanic but he's also a master at building ice strips on frozen lakes. Building your own ice strip to do a job is very old school. So we had to pull up someone really old school, which is Jimmy Esri, who's been at Buffalo since the 70s. Throw Jimmy Esri on an airplane, get him out there, and hope for the best. Jimmy will fly on a twin otter and land on skis at a mining camp on Sunrise Lake, 130 kilometers northeast of Yellowknife. No one has ever built an ice strip on Sunrise before, let alone landed Buffalo's massive warbirds on it. And it's dangerously late in the season. But the mining company has no choice. It has a heavy drill to move in. This is the only way it can come in right now is on the big planes that Buffalo is able to supply. If we could have a warming spell, the ice could disappear which would mean we wouldn't be able to do a drill program until next winter, so we would lose a whole year. The window from ice to no ice is really shortening up. It's melting fast. You know, this is the most riskiest thing we've done yet this year. The timeline was there because every day we're getting two to three degrees warmer. If the ice is too soft and thin, it could crack under the weight of the plane. That's what happened to a DC-3 near Yellowknife back in 1961. When they eventually pulled it out of the water, 16-year-old Joe McBride was there. Jimmy may be Buffalo's ice strip expert, but he's never had just 48 hours to build one before. And Joe doesn't believe it's even possible. They can build a strip that quick, you know, 5,000 or 3 or 4,000 feet on a lake like that with a cap. I don't know if you guys realize how much shoveling that is. There is no way a guy with a, a bobcat can build a strip within two days. Jimmy had all the information. And I'm just going by what Jimmy said. They're going to try and put in a strip overnight. It's just going to be a, a dog trailer. On approach to Sunrise Lake, Jimmy gets his first look at what he's up against. Where they wanted the strip was kind of narrow for a C-46. You always have to leave room for air. Where they wanted, there was no room for any air whatsoever. Like, it, everything had to be perfect, perfect. Okay, we're ready to drill some holes, test the ice, plow some snow, make a strip. But it's not quite that simple. Every strip is different. You know, every snow is different. Every every lake is different. And you can see it's really rough. And if we bounce a couple of times, we don't have any any room for air here. Got to be safe. 
You know, the pilots are depending on me. I'm depending on the pilots. We're depending on the airplane. There's a lot of ifs, and we're trying to eliminate every if, if we can. <laughs> Anytime you're messing around with ice, it's extremely dangerous. Uh, you can imagine now, you're landing on a runway that's technically floating, and it's unstable, and it's unpredictable. What we're coming up to here is water, water under the snow. There, you can see it's wet right there. There we go. Okay. We can't do nothing with that. For this part, the lake is screwed. If Jimmy can't find solid ice, no Buffalo cargo plane will be able to land. The mining company will have to wait till next year to fly the drill in. Jimmy's got to find 36 inches of ice for the C-46 to go in there with the full load. See how black it is? So that's almost 36 inches here. We're going right to the flute here. That's a 36 inch hogger, so. Yeah, we picked out 3,600 feet of the best we could. Just long enough for a strip. But that means plowing more than 2 million cubic feet of snow in just two days. Well, it all depends on uh, the size of the equipment you have. You know, the bigger the equipment, of course, the less amount of work. But... When I got there, there was this little Tonka toy, a little dinky toy. It's not very heavy, and it's got a very small blade. I wish I had a little bigger piece of machinery. I'm down here. It's been a while. Almost lost it all. Nice trip that Jimmy Ezri is being passed to build in hours, not weeks. The snow only moves so fast. The cat only moves so fast. You can only last so long. Well, we had a long couple of days. The first plane is expected to land here the day after tomorrow. If the ice is firm enough and Jimmy can clear the strip in time. In Hay River, new DC-3 co-pilot Tyler Sipos is getting Buffalo's regularly scheduled passenger flight to Yellowknife ready. Tyler's hard work on the ramp has already won him the chance to co-pilot DC-3 freighters. The way I was brought up was whatever job you do, do it the best you can. And it needs to get done, and you don't overthink it, and you just do a really good job. Well, whatever Tyler's doing, it's working. He's getting the best reviews out of anybody right now. And today, Tyler will take the right seat in the sked beside the company's most demanding captain, Buffalo Joe himself. I've been told there's no way of doing things, and you have to know everything, absolutely everything. It's the old man's ride, and he's done it for as long as I've been alive. You know, close to almost 30 years now. You make a mistake with Joe there, and you're going to have to pay the price. It's a big thing, flying for the first time with Joe. You don't want to disappoint. You don't want to piss him off. You don't want to screw up in front of him. You don't want to look incompetent, because then he's like, why did I hire you? Back to fuel. Check your steps. Yes, sir. Joe is known for putting new sked co-pilots through the ringer, and it's starting already. You know how to get your inches by your temperature? Oh, yeah, it's uh, minus one inch for every uh, one degree below, or 10 degrees below standard. It was right away just blasting you with questions. What temperature does it start at? Uh, 15 degrees. Drilling you about the aircraft, drilling you about the systems, about speeds. What do you got? You got 300? No, you don't. You got 250. Uh, you're up. Roger. Yeah, I have control here. I have control. 
With Tyler in control, Joe can concentrate on other matters, like grilling him some more. If you climb 500 feet to the first thousand, calculate how far out you'd be if you dropped under 5,000. We start off at 400 feet per nautical mile. Why don't we get on course before we do anything else? Yes, sir. You take your focus off the aircraft for one second to pay attention to what the heck he's saying, all of a sudden you're climbing or you're descending. If you take a car up the hill, what do you do? Change speeds all the way up the hill? No, sir. Get to drive a car? Yes, sir. And then all of a sudden, he's giving you shit for descending. It's just, you're getting shit on no matter what. Tyler has another 40 minutes in the cockpit with Joe. 40 long minutes. Get the tail of the airplane up for dragging ass. The guy's got to learn to do two things at once. Over Great Slave Lake, a Buffalo Airways DC-3 begins its descent with a rookie co-pilot in the hot seat next to the boss. Gear's coming down. Okay, now what did you do? You lifted that handle, you took that handle, neutral down, right? Yes, I'm going to make sure that the wheel's down. Okay, now, well, you did that wrong. You know, you got to get that sequence down, right? You got to know that shit. And if you don't, I'll just hound the living shit on until he quit. Think before you do anything. Do that over again. Just don't touch okay. You guys are gonna have to sit out in this airplane with your buddies and go through the system. You don't know the system. He has all these expectations for you, and all of a sudden, your first flight with him is a huge disappointment. I was disappointed in myself. Disappointed that I disappointed him. In one short flight, Tyler's stock has plummeted. You'll see winners take a slowdown, you'll see sleepers come alive, so it's very hard to tell at this stage. Winning back Joe's confidence is going to be tough. It's just after sunrise at Sunrise Lake. Morning. 5 a.m. Nice day. Sky's clear. Time to go move some snow. Jimmy Essery has 36 hours left to plow an ice strip as wide as a football field and more than 10 times as long. <laughs> Just keep doing the loops, trying to beat it to death. Every time you play with snow, you knock the air and the oxygen out of it, and then you wind up with less snow, less snow, less snow. To finish the strip, Jimmy will have to plow up and down the lake dozens of times, then smooth the surface. A lot of work. And Jimmy's not getting much help from a plow designed to clear walking paths, not 4,000-foot runways. This little tractor is right out of snack pushing. It just, you uh, wouldn't want the snow to be another, even another two inches deeper than this. Jimmy plows on. storm was coming in, it was getting kind of worried. I didn't know whether it was going to be a long-lasting storm or, or there was no weather report. Try to call the big guy here, make a plan. Hey, Jimmy. Progress report. How's it going? Everything's going according to plan, except for this stupid snowstorm we're having right now. Holy smokes. Um, how's the strip? Uh, I got to extend it another 400 feet for a C-46. Well, hopefully it clears up tomorrow. If the snow doesn't stop soon, Jimmy will be back to square one. We're just trying to organize the ice trip, make it all work. Mikey needs a captain who can land the big planes on ice. Now is better than tomorrow. And that captain is AJ DeCoast. You want me to show you on the map? Yeah, I do. OK, Jimmy's going to give me the exact coordinates, and then two loads of sunrise, and then come home. 
What is it, gold up there or something? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. AJ, who's probably the most calmest pilot that we have, uh, you put those two together and you can hit the numbers. And that's basically all you want to do is get the numbers right because you got one chance. And uh, if you blow that chance, you're going to be, you know, leaving an airplane on the side of a lake for a year. Well, that's what actually works so good as far as I'm concerned because we'll get a chance to look at it with the three. Yep. The three is so much more maneuverable and all that. Mm -hmm. You get a real good look at the strip. And then we can go at it with the 46. Yeah. Uh, no, they got a, they got a cool, cool, cool crew there. I believe AJ is the person that can bring it in. The next morning on Sunrise Lake, Jimmy wakes up to clear skies. But the overnight snowfall has put him way behind schedule. The snow is fairly deep. I'm quite surprised there's so much snow. In only a few hours, AJ and his fully loaded DC-3 will try to land here. So Jimmy's getting a last minute hand from the workers at the mining camp. They're using snowmobiles to smooth the strip. Every little bit helps, especially since on today's flight, the plane is carrying more than just cargo. The first trip that we have is passengers on board. Now, when you talk about aviation, passengers are the hardest cargo in the world to, to haul because they're human beings. An ice strip on a frozen lake can be hard to spot from the air. Jimmy needs some markers, so he improvises with garbage bags. If it gets a real bad day, like cloudy like that, yeah. you can't tell how far the ground is away. So if you have the bag, the airplane has a reference to where the ground is. He's nearly finished his ice strip, but will it do the job? You build a strip top of All kinds of things go through your mind, you know, like, did I make it far up this way? Is it wide enough? He has to abort. Does he have enough room to get out of here? There's no time for improvements. A plane full of people is about to put Jimmy's ice strip to the test. You know what we could do is we could just back that trailer up to the airplane. In Hay River, Captain AJ DeCoast and co-pilot Andrew Vike are getting ready to fly a DC-3 full of passengers and cargo onto an ice strip on Sunrise Lake. But the temperature is rising. We were thinking, hey, is this weather going to warm right up and is this strip going to be done? You know, how warm is it going to get? If it gets too warm, the strip will deteriorate and landing could become dangerous. You can see, once the sun starts hitting these hills and it gets some heat to it, the water will run down and this bay will flood. It'll flood right out. It's over 3,000 pounds of gear. What are you thinking? Including the sled? Not including the sled. All the guys there, all eight passengers, they helped us load the plane, so it went very fast. Uh, the majority of the cargo was their gear. The eight passengers are heading to Sunrise Lake to conduct a geophysical survey for the mining company. Because it is uh, a custom-built strip just for you guys, really. We got our best uh, runway guy there right now. Safety first. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if I all this car. <laughs> <laughs> the real dangers of this job is the unknown. We're flying by the seat of our pants. It's up to the boys now. These guys got to see if they can land on an unknown airstrip, which is pretty risky. Taxi, runway 31, we're via fire. Heading northbound. Go ahead, advisory. At Sunrise Lake, there's no tower, not even communication with anyone on the ground. You don't have any runway surface condition, you don't have any report of winds, you just gotta figure it out on your own. In under an hour, AJ will face an untested landing strip that he's never seen before. knowing the condition of the strip from flying overhead you can't really tell there's no way to tell other than doing it watching closely is Larry Dussault his job today is flight attendant but he has other things on his mind 
I wasn't a very good uh, <laughs> flight attendant because I was mostly in the cockpit looking at what we were going to land on. He has good reason. Larry will be AJ's co-pilot on tomorrow's flight in the C-46. It's going to help me prepare myself if I'm actually there to see what that ice trip is. The crew tries to calculate wind direction. The plane has to land into the wind to get maximum control. There's very few indications to give you the direction of the wind. There aren't any wind socks or anything around. The only way to determine wind direction is to compare the DC-3's airspeed indicator with the GPS's ground speed reading. If your ground speed is higher than what's indicated in your aircraft, then you know that you've got a tailwind. You've got a wind pushing you, making you go faster. One approach is a gentle descent along the lake. The opposite side requires an extremely steep drop over a hill onto the strip. And to land into the wind today, AJ will have to come in over the hill. It was a lot harder to, to try to get a good touchdown at the beginning of the runway with that hill there. On a short runway, every meter counts. AJ needs to get his wheels down right at the start of the strip or risk running off the other end. Hopefully, it's good enough. If you have a hard spot on one side, a soft spot on one side, you could put it on his nose. The pilot has to be right on the ball. I had to hug the hill pretty closely and then take power off altogether to get down. AJ kills the power. When you cut the throttles like that, that plane's gonna drop. It's gonna drop like a rock. But the steep drop into position makes the landing more difficult. Oh. kind of happens when you get some ruts and stuff kicks you back in the air. Sorry. I think he says sorry. Get a hand there. Hey, hey, how you doing? Hey. Are they good? Though? Yeah, no. Strip looked big until that f***ing DC3 got here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The strip is now. just big enough for the DC3, but tomorrow's flight is in a much larger C-46 carrying twice the payload. A DC-3 lands slower, don't need as much ice. Doesn't have to be as wide, doesn't have to be as long. AJ and Jimmy start thinking ahead. The DC-3 was actually a godsend coming in there first because uh, then AJ and I could discuss this and uh, prepare for the 46. When it's down flat like this, this is great. This amount of snow on here right now, that'd be perfect if it was all like that. But then you get big humps in it. The C-46, as compared to the DC-3, is uh, trickier to land, tends to bounce a lot worse. <laughs> AJ needs Jimmy to pack down the strip even more. It's just some of this deeper stuff. Like when you hook the wheel into some of that, eh? Down the ice. I'm not sure what it's going to do exactly. If it grabs on one side, it might want to pull it over a bit. I'll stay here and clean it up. Tomorrow's load, a 13,000-pound diamond drill, is desperately needed by the mining company. So you're not going out tonight, no. then? <laughs> you got to stay one more night in yeah. camp. You got you to gotta keep going. So. He's scared to see six my hook wheel. I was wondering, because when he landed and he was bouncing, I was worried about that. So. <laughs> but you can have it done tonight so you can land. They're still going to bring him in tomorrow? Oh, yeah. Be sure right tomorrow. on. Good. I had 24 hours to widen it out to extend it to, to get the bumps down. When AJ returns, he'll be putting his faith in Jimmy once again. And with a much bigger plane, there's no margin for error. All right, we go out here, hang out for some oil. It's family day at Buffalo. Hi, baby. There you go. There you go. 
And Rod's daughter, Emma Ray, is the center of attention. Emma's first birthday was coming up, so I really wanted to get her something that she can have for a lifetime. Did Uncle Mike get you a present? Uncle Mikey had somebody sketch a picture of Baby Ray. I just took a picture from my cell phone and emailed it to the artist. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. <laughs> Sasha's trying to be positive. It is beautiful, and it's beautifully framed, Uncle. Well, you know what? Not every painting can be a winner. It actually looks like the picture. Yeah, <laughs> let's see the picture. Because, <laughs> yeah, you could have picked a better picture. <laughs> but, Uncle, that's OK. It's beautiful, and it's the thought that counts. It's just beautiful. We'll put it right front and center in her room. Thank God, awful thing. <laughs> you shouldn't really give someone a cell phone picture and, and expect the Mona Lisa. Mikey will have to come up with something spectacular to make up for this. Thank you, Uncle. So maybe I should sign the back. Yeah, you should sign it. So whenever you guys are ready, you go right ahead. All right, let's do this. Upstairs, rookie Tyler Seapos is spending hours of precious time glued to the DC-3 flight simulator. I'm kind of a perfectionist. I like to do everything that I do to the fullest. Last flat, please. My throttles. Tyler's first flight as Joe's co-pilot was far from perfect. He said that he was really disappointed because he thought I was a lot better than I am, which is heartbreaking. Can I put the 25 there, Andrew? Uh, go like 27. 27, yeah. Take a couple so Tyler's convinced Andrew Vike, who also trained with Joe, to tutor him. Um, do whatever you need to do to keep that plane going like this. You don't want it to go up. You don't want it to go down. That's one of Joe's big things that you need to know. Okay. I think Joe's tactic is to give you the harshest criticism right at the beginning, see how you react, see if you can take it. He wants to tell you what you did wrong, and you fix it. And I plan on doing that. There it is, so Miles, gear down landing checks. I, don't know, I hope to, to show him that I am a good pilot, and hopefully I don't disappoint him again. Good job, guys. The next day in Hay River, AJ and his rookie co-pilot Larry I fly this now. Are getting ready for Buffalo's second flight to the ice strip on Sunrise Lake. Yeah. Yesterday, AJ flew there in a DC-3 and bounced the landing. Oh, it was a bit challenging with the DC-3, but now we're talking about a 46 heavier, faster aircraft. That's when there's a lot of what if that comes into play. Fully loaded, the C-46 is twice the weight of the DC-3. With the heavier plane, AJ will be putting more stress on the ice strip. This is a typical drill move. Basically, you got the drill rod, the drill. I mean, there's some pretty ugly stuff to move, so we have 1,200 of these. So we got about 7,200 pounds of, of drill rods. Miscellaneous stuff from a coffee maker to a... Uh... Don't forget the brand new <laughs> washing machine. That's probably looking at 1,000 pounds a piece. It's not easy, like, pushing pallets up there. You got to put it all by hand, strap it down. AJ has to keep a running tally on the weight as they load the plane. We'll try to put that motor on there next. We'll set it down on a couple blocks so we can get under it. It's barely on there, so make sure. But during the loading, he spots a problem. We're going to have to find some more weight to put in the back. Something, whatever's easy to put back there. The tail's sticking right in the air right now, so we know that the airplane's loaded nose heavy. You can see the tail it's up over my head, basically, so you can tell just by that that it's nose heavy. A well-balanced airplane really makes a big difference as far as your approach and landing. Yep, let's do that, man. AJ adds more drill rods to balance the plane. At 60 pounds each, 15 of them will bring the C-46 to a maximum load of 13,000 pounds. Ready, right? She's a huge beast. She's very difficult to control. Especially during takeoffs and landing. If you're not very, very careful, she can be very dangerous. Uh, 
does a low pass to determine wind direction. It looks like we've got a tailwind on going this way, eh? Yeah. All right, we'll plan to land on the uh, southeast bound. Good. The wind direction is once again forcing them to approach over a hill, requiring a very steep final descent. You actually have to go down to the hill, keep it steady, and then dive past the hill. This time, they're in a much heavier plane carrying a much heavier load. Here down. Sure. And Jimmy has had less than a day to get the strip ready for the big C-46. I don't know, it's still looking narrow. Finals are complete. Thank you. Captain A.J. DeCoast is guiding a 50,000-pound plane towards three feet of ice on Sunrise Lake. Those two. Drop one set. There's no way of knowing for sure if the ice will hold. And to top it off, it's a tricky approach. A.J. will have to drop suddenly after clearing a hill to catch the start of the strip. And on the slick surface, he could have trouble stopping before he runs out of runway. On the gills trail? Yeah. The last thing he wants to do is use the brakes. If you need to use your brakes and it's slippery, then they're not going to work, and you're going to slide off into the snow. Once you start sliding, there's all kinds of things you go wrong. Like Murphy's Law, it's right there knocking on your door. Not you. Not to come. When you don't have the brakes, there are other things that you can use. Set uh, three. If we leave the flaps in the up position, we actually create aerodynamic drag, which also slows the aircraft. You know, that's basically about all you can do. We don't have reverse like uh, a lot of airplanes do have. Pull fast, pull flap. Pull flap set. Jimmy left about an inch of snow on the strip, which should provide a little traction. You don't leave enough snow on the strip, and you can slip, and go off to the side, hook a wheel, and wind up over the snow bank. 30 green, one ember, okay. 105 or 98. Okay. Once he's over the hill, AJ kills the power and drops. Up nice. It was a lot smoother. We actually had some traction with the snow there. Hey, good landing, by the way. Thanks. Jimmy did a really good job with the runway, and AJ did a really good job on his approach, which led to a brakeless landing. We made it. We're still on top of the ice. That was an unbelievable landing. The DC-3 that came in the other day, it was quite bumpy. He, he, he bounced a lot, but it was a nice landing. Way to go, AJ. <laughs> Wherever he is. The mining camp has its diamond drill, but there's something it doesn't have, a forklift. And that's not like the equipment. Some pieces are over 3,000 pounds. So how do you unload it? Fortunately, Buffalo has a unique solution. Joe had a ramp specifically built to uh, offload in cases where there's no forklift available, where the door's, you know, assessed 10 feet high. You need to have something and you're dealing with, you know, 14, 15, 1,600 pound pieces. What's the plan there, Jimmy? We'll bring it out, put the head, put two legs on it. Aluminum, it's all bolted together in planks, and if you load it in the airplane right, it's very simple to put it together systematically as it comes out of the airplane. And the crew, a customer that we worked for, very hardworking. There wasn't a lazy bone in the whole camp. AJ and Jimmy pulled off the job in the nick of time. Yeah, that's oh, good. Well. Good job right. done. Pull up. Pull up set. A little bit of left right 
teman-teman It was a good surprise to see the work that Jimmy did. Unbelievable for two days. And because of him, uh, this was a successful mission. Yes! That was the ice cream. He never even had to use the brakes. Proud of yourself? A little bit. The job got done. Everybody's happy. You know, let's, let's go home and uh, maybe have a beer and celebrate. Days later, the temperatures have risen, and it's full-on spring in Yellowknife. Okay, we're over in Tower now. Watch it to protection now. Rookie co-pilot Tyler is about to fly the DC-3 passenger flight with Joe once again. Clear to taxi. Runway 09er. Okay, we're going there now. And clear my side. The first time didn't go so well. He got really pissed off. Tommy, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. But Tyler's been studying hard and is anxious to prove himself to Joe. You got the pins, you got the locks. Pins and locks, kill items are complete. The fact that he still flew with me shows a lot, I think. Because normally, if you really piss him off, he's like, get this guy out of here, get somebody else in that can actually fly. It's still a little intimidating, that's for sure. But I'm always up for the challenge. 168 waiting in position. Right before takeoff, Joe ups the ante. You'll be doing the departure. Joe usually does the takeoff. Clear to go up, we're take we're rolling. But today, with the plane loaded with over 20 passengers, Tyler will be in control. I have the throttles now. After a terrible first flight with Joe, co-pilot Tyler is back in the cockpit with the boss, and Joe is putting him to the test. You'll be doing the departure. Joe has just told Tyler he'll do the takeoff. Try and get a feel for that thing at 60 knots. Okay. Tyler's future at Buffalo could be decided in the next few minutes. Clear to go for one thing, Dave, rolling. It was stressful, a lot of pressure, and a little scared. <laughs> but keep your heels on the floor. Say you got to keep it straight. Get, get that nose down there. Get, get it down there, that load on it. Get right. that 60 there. Yep. And then let her go. Let her touch. Let her go. You're flying a passenger aircraft. He wants you to be smooth. He wants you to be able to take off, level out, without them even knowing that they've left the ground. All right, bring it back to 34. Roger, coming back. Easy. We don't want everybody to know that we're reducing power. Roger, check. It's a complicated aircraft, and the systems are rudimentary. There's no autopilot. It's all hand flying, so the smoothness of the aircraft reflects on the smoothness of the pilot. Uh, okay, we got to get her up to 5,000 feet. It's going to be a long, old climb. I mean, uh... During his first flight with Tyler, Joe blasted him with corrections and criticisms. But now, he hardly says a word. Going to still land uh, 5,000? Yeah, we're up there, but he's like, where I am, right. He was quiet for the rest of the flight. Joe's silence speaks for itself. As long as, as they quickly become better, I shut up, and that's, that's really how it is. Four flaps. All right, Four flaps set. Pressure's up, green light. That was a nice flight. <laughs> it, was, it was very quiet the entire way. And, uh, you can never really know what's going on in Joe's mind. You never know if you're in the good books or the bad books, but he seems to be not yelling at me, you know? <laughs> so I'm happy, yeah, I'm happy. Back in Yellowknife, Mikey is pulling out all the stops. Man, the kids are gonna literally shit their pants when they see this. Yep. There'd be shit everywhere. He's hoping to make up for the portrait he had made for his niece Emma Ray's first birthday. If the family wasn't too impressed with the painting, I guess I'll have to make it up. A first birthday is a huge uh, occasion, so why not go overboard? This is, this is absolutely insane. I've never ever seen anything really 
fun in the hangar before, but this is kind of cool. Shoes off kind of thing, no smoking. <laughs> Look at that thing. That is awesome. Let's see the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Look at her laughing. This is the shit, eh? It's fun. This is just turning out to be a lot of fun. Having a kid's birthday party in the hangar seemed surprisingly natural to me. I don't think the real world would see it that way. But luckily, we don't live in the real world. 